you. God bless your heart. Yeah. Thank you. Glad you're here. Didn't you enjoy the testimonies? I do. The Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord do something. Say, Say so. so. Yeah. We're supposed to talk about the things of God. One time a, a theologian challenged me. He said, uh, I don't think you ought to spend so much time talking about miracles. I said, oh, you don't? He said, no. And so I began to study the Bible on how many times it tells us to talk about miracles. It says, we shall speak of his mighty acts. We shall tell one generation and applaud and, and laud the mighty things of God so the next generation can understand all the goodness of God. So we are supposed to talk about miracles. The guys that don't want to talk about them are those that don't have them. Now, let me tell you about not having miracles. If you're in a church that doesn't have signs and wonders, I think you're probably in a church that's disqualified itself from being a New Testament church. Look out now. That's a mouthful. If you are in a church that does not have signs and wonders and miracles, you're probably in a church that's disqualified itself from being a New Testament church. You might say, Bobby, where do you get a statement like that? Uh, Mark 16, 20 would be a good one to start with. They went out the early church, preached, prophesied, released miracles, and it says, and God testified to what they were doing with signs following. We need signs and wonders. Everybody believes in signs and wonders. God does a sign. You and I do the wondering of what in the world was that? <laughs> I've been preaching this year will be 48, uh, 48 years this year. And I've averaged speaking five times a week right now for 47 years. And here's what I figured out. I figured out that, that's right. 47 years, five times a week. I've averaged speaking five times a week. Guess what? I'm living proof. Practice don't make perfect. <laughs> yeah. See that? Yeah. But listen, here's what, here's what I, after all that preaching, here's what I figured out. I figured out if you can figure it out, it ain't a move of God. Yeah. If you can wrap your mind around and go, yes, I see that. No, the natural mind receives not the things of the spirit. It's foolishness to you. Neither can you know it. It must be spiritually discerned. So do you understand what I was saying? The moves of God blows our mind. It just I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither is in the heart of man the things that God has prepared to those that love him. Listen, God, God's things are so big we can't wrap our mind around it. The most simple, simple thing of God is so profound we can't get it with our natural mind. It has to be understood by the Spirit. The simplest things from God. And so God wants to explain some things to us, teach us some things, and he's wonderful. Isn't he wonderful? One, t one time I took the platform in a big old coliseum and I screamed, you know, there's no one like Jesus. That's what I said. And when I said that, the Holy Spirit said, yes, and that's such a shame. Wow. See, it's the plan of God, the purpose of God to make us all just like Jesus. Yeah. God wants us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, who's Christ the image of? Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the express image of the invisible God. Wow. Say invisible. invisible. What does invisible mean? Can't see. You can't see him. You can't see God till you see him in the form he chooses to reveal himself. Remember he said, and you shall have a son. You shall call him Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, we saw his glory. Listen, you can't know God apart from Jesus. And I think the Bible teaches you can't know Jesus apart from the Holy Ghost. No man can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. Aren't you glad God is a great initiator? He's the one that woos us. There's a verse in the Bible talking about God wooing back his backslidden people. It says, I will allure her, my backslidden people, out to the wilderness, and there I'll win her back with words of love. Wow. Aren't you glad he doesn't give up on us? There's a story, a whole, well, there's a whole uh, chapter in the Bible concerning that, and it's uh, the book of Hosea. Hosea. Hosea was a prophet, and he had to marry a girl that was a hooker. A hooker. Remember her? Gomer. And she's the type of us. That's the bad thing. She was unfaithful to him. Go sell herself. He'd have to go and buy her back. The whole book of Hosea is in the Bible to show us how unfaithful we become to God and how faithful he is to go buy us back. Wow, isn't that something? You know what I told God? I said, God... The, uh, the name would have been bad enough, let alone the occupation. This is my wife, Gomer. Yeah, 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 pretty bad, I think. Hosea, one time I was whining. Uh, you call it intercession. God called it whining. I said, God, why do you make me do so many silly things? I thought he'd cuddle me and go, Bobby, you're such a champion. Guess what he said? I've never presented you as stupid as you really are. 
That's what he said. Yeah, and then, then he started showing me the Old Testament prophets and what they had to go through. Woo, have you studied those guys? <sighs> Jeremiah had to walk into the council meeting in a diaper, a linen rag. Wow, Ezekiel sometimes didn't have that much. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go camping and him being the cook. You read what he was supposed to cook with. Yeah, well, anyway. So I thought, oh, listen, I'm going to quit whining and just say, God, I'll do anything you ask me to do. Now, listen, a while ago, I talked about being preaching 47 years, five times a week. If, if you would come to me and say, Bobby, do you have any advice for me? Here's the advice I'd give you. You come to me and ask, Bobby, do you have any advice that you could give to me that would help me along my journey with God? Here it is. The best advice I could give any of us, swift and complete obedience. Do as quickly as you can, as thorough as you can, anything God asks you to do. If you don't do that, it'll stagnate you. It'll stop you. It'll stagger you off the pathway of God. Attempting to alter what God tries to say, do as quickly as you can, as thorough as you can, anything God asks you to do. Ask King Saul if there's any, any feedback, any blowback to doing it your way instead of God's. Remember, it cost him the whole kingdom, didn't it? Yes. Well, tonight I'm going to talk to you about some stuff. I'm going to talk to you about uh, holding on to hope. The devil, without he, he has been relentless for the past two decades trying to steal your hope. I'll tell you what happened on, on one of the days of atonement. I saw a cloud, a cloud way out in the horizon. It didn't look any bigger than a person's hand. And the Lord Jesus stood by me and with urgency, extreme urgency in his voice, he said, Bobby, tell my people to avoid, avoid that raging cloud. I said to him, God, how can you call that a raging cloud? Didn't look any bigger than a man's hand. He, and he said emphatically, tell my people to avoid that raging cloud. I said, God. What's so menacing about that cloud? He said, that cloud has the propensity to steal every gift I want to give my people. That cloud is the cloud of doubt. Doubt. Doubt is one of the most deadly things that will ever come into your life. Doubt is not benign. Doubt is a womb that gives birth to unbelief. If you want to see doubt in its full flower, doubt in full flower it had to be seen in Matthew 11. There's a man, Jesus Christ said about this man, born of woman, there's none greater than John the Baptist. That's what he said. Born of woman, there's none greater. This John the Baptist, the same John the Baptist that said, look, uh, behold, observe the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But Mark, Matthew 11, Matthew 11, verse 1 and 2, we find John in prison now. And his whole demeanor has changed. Verse 2 says, John called some of his disciples. Matthew eleven two. 2. He called some of his disciples and said, I've got a mission for you. Would you please do it? They said, certainly. Certainly, John, we'll do anything you ask us to do. Here's what he said. I want you, for me, to go ask Jesus Christ, are you really him that we should look for, or should we focus somewhere else? I don't think you can fall any further than that. Away from your original calling. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now, would you go to something to ask Jesus, are you really him? Or should we look somewhere else? That's the full flower of doubt. Wow. Wow. Now, here's what happened. Those disciples from John go to Jesus. They say, Jesus, we're here because John has sent us, and we've got a question he wants you to answer for him. Are you really him? Or should we look somewhere else? I love the response. Jesus Christ says to John's disciples, you go back. You share with John, show him, reveal to him, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dumb speak, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached. What can we learn from that? What's an antidote for doubt? Miracles. Miracles are an antidote for doubt. You go back, show John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dumb speak, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached. That's why we need miracles. The Bible said, and multitudes, that means a bunch, and multitudes believed on Jesus when they saw the miracles he did. The Bible says, John 11, John says, this big, the Bible said, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. That's the first miracle recorded that Jesus did. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and it manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. 
So I believe that's the ministry of the church is to cause people to have a firmer faith in Messiah and to cause people to get saved. That's what the first miracle did. Isn't that wonderful? Say yes. wonder why he did it in Cana of Galilee. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana. He could have picked any place on earth, but he chose Cana of Galilee. Study it. Stud, study the history books about Cana of Galilee. At the time of Jesus, it was known for one thing. What? Not a commerce, not some big uh, hub of a city. It was known for one thing. Little bitty reeds. Little bitty reeds that grew by the water bank. It's the kind of reeds that they would make little children's whistles. That's, the kind of, that's what it was known for. See, God loves to show up where there's childlikeness about us. Yeah, that's, he really does. It's the same little kind of flute David would play out when he was playing with his sheep. That's what Cana was known for. God loves to move where there's this childlike attitude. Except you become as a little child. You can't see or enter the kingdom. That's what Jesus said. I suspect a lot of people are going to have to digress in order to advance. Quickest way to spot religion is they make complicated what God made simple. They put a lot of hoops in a lot of the, a lot. Of, there's a verse in the Bible that said, The way of salvation is so simple that a wayfaring fool need not ear therein. Wow. So I said to God, give me that in Texican. Give me that in a language people can understand. Oh, by the way, I speak Texican. I went to London, England, had to have an interpreter. <laughs> That's the honest to God truth. I went to London, England, and had to have an interpreter. But I speak Texican. What's going to stun you is this. You ever hear God talk? He talks just like me. <laughs> so, I'll tell you how he talks. You want to know how he talks? He talks exactly like you listen. That's how God talks. Where's the verse for that? John 10, 3. My sheep hear my voice. John 10, 27 says, they flee other voices, but they'll follow his voice. You say, well, Bobby, how can I really know it's God's voice? Woo. Nothing will amplify the voice of God like intimacy. My wife and I have been married 53 years. She calls me and I go, who is this? Woo. You talk about trouble. <laughs> yeah. when she, I should be able to tell whether she's happy or sad just by the tone of her voice. Nothing amplifies hearing the voice of God like intimacy. I used to think if God had something really important to say to me, he'd get me by the shoulders and go, Bobby! It's right the opposite. He said, it's a sign of your immaturity if I have to shout at you. He said, you should be so close to me I can guide you with my eye. Remember the verse in the Bible? You ever seen a parent guide the children with their eye? Little Junior reaches for something, Dad goes, <clears throat> he goes, whoa, I don't think I'll do that. What is that a sign of prior instruction? Dad and juniors had a talk about that. Don't you want to be easily entreated? So I used to think God uh, would really, you know, shout at me, but he told me, he said, it's a sign of your immaturity if I shout at you. Talking about shouting, here's what God said. He said, tell my people I shout my truths, but I whisper my secrets. See, any of us can get his truths, the Bible's full of them. But few of us will get his secrets. Say secrets. You believe God has secrets? Yes, Bobby. Is there any verse about it? Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, the secret things belong unto God, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our descendants from now on. Wow. Aren't you glad God wants our children to get in on his secrets? That's Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our descendants from now on. How do we get what God wants to reveal? We let the Holy Spirit lead us. And uh, Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John 16, uh, 13, he will glorify me. Wow, aren't you glad? That's what the Holy Ghost will do. One preacher told me, said one time, oh, Bobby, I'd be so afraid just to let go and let the Holy Ghost have his way. No tell him what will happen. I said, I'll tell you exactly what will happen. Jesus will get glorified. He will glorify me. That's what Jesus said about Holy Ghost. You ought to hear what Jesus says about Holy Ghost. Wow. You want to hear a little bit about it? He said, go with me there just for a moment. This is not what I was going to talk about, but I'm talking about it anyway. John, uh, John, if you will, and we'll, we'll show it to you here. Uh, I love what Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit here. John 16, verse 13 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, the truth-giving Spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole truth, the full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell you whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. 
Verse 14, he will glorify and honor me because he will take of mine and receive and draw upon it and then take what is mine and reveal it unto you. Wow. You guide us in the truth, the whole truth, the full truth. I like that. For but when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into what? All the truth, the whole truth, and the full truth. Wow. That's what Jesus said about Holy Ghost. You can't know the Bible just by studying commentaries. You've got to have the Holy Ghost to teach you. Aren't you glad he lives in you to teach you? He'll show you what it really means. But that's now here's what I want to talk about tonight. All of that's okay. I want to talk about holding on to hope. The devil wants to steal, decimate, destroy your hope. The Bible said hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when it comes, what you've hoped for, dreamed for, longed for, it's a wellspring, a geyser of living life. So we're going to talk about how to hold on to hope. Now, here's your great verse about holding on to hope. Hebrews 10, 35. Hebrews 10, 35 says, Do not fling away your steadfast confidence in God, your hope. Do not fling away your steadfast confidence in God, your hope, because your steadfast confidence in God, your hope, brings with it a great recompense of reward. One translation in the modern language says, Hang on to hope. It pays big dividends. Hang on to hope. Hang on to hope. So here's, here's your verse. You ready? Psalms 30, verse 5. Psalms 30, verse 5. It says, God's anger with us is but for a tiny moment. His favor is for a complete lifetime or is a life. That's what it says. His favor is for a lifetime. And then here's the part you remember. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. So I want to talk to you about holding on to hope. What a difference one day can make. What a vast difference one single day can make. One single day can change the destiny of you and your entire lineage line for eternity. What a difference one day can make. Psalms 30 verse 5. God's anger is for a tiny moment. His faith, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. I want to talk to you about holding on to hope is a new day dawning. Aren't you glad for a new day? Lamentation 3 says, God's mercies are something every morning. New every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Aren't you glad every morning God gets up in a good mood? Pushes the reset button. Lamentation 3, 20 and 21, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. That's why we're not consumed. I'm thankful for that. Lamentation 3, 20 and 21, the new day. God wants a new day to dawn upon the church. The, the, the new day God wants to bring upon us is this day of understanding. He will bring to pass anything he's ever promised us. So here, here we go. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. I want to show you one of the first guys I want to introduce you to that experienced a traumatic change in one day. You have to meet him. He's a very strange character in the Bible. I call him the nude, rude dude. <laughs> the nude, rude dude. You're introduced to him in the gospel of Mark. I love the different gospels. Each gospel presents Jesus in a different genre, a different light. The gospel of Mark presents Jesus of action. The most repetitive statement in the gospel of Mark is immediately and straightway. Say this with me. Mark Mark. is the book of action. I've always loved it. Boy, it it, it is one thing right after another. I never have like, I've never did like rehearsal and scrimmage. I never like sparring when I box. I like when the whistle blows and the bell rings. I like the main event. That's what the book of Mark is. It's action. Most repetitive word is immediately and straightway. So it's the book of Acts. So Mark chapter 5 is where it actually the story starts in Mark chapter 4. Somewhere around verse 37, Jesus Christ says to the disciples, Boys, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Remember the story? The disciples, before they were disciples, most of them were fishermen. So they get in the boat. And it says Jesus gets in the boat with them. It says in my Bible, he goes to sleep on a leather pillow. That's what it says in my Bible. I like that. Because he had already told him, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Jesus goes, sleep. Uh, About midway across the little lake there, a big, horrendous storm comes. And the boat is about to sink. There's water, the lightning flashing, waves roaring. Boat looks like it's going to sink. The disciples are absolutely petrified. They start screaming. If you read this in the Greek, it is drama. They're screaming, Master, get up. Don't you care? We're going to drown. 
I'm glad Jesus didn't get up and go, ah! No, I'm, that's not what he did. I don't like what the King James does with this passage. Uh, this is all uh, in the Gospels, Mark, Mark chapter 4, along there around 37. And it says that Jesus, that the King James says, and Jesus stood and says to the storm, peace, be still. <laughs> that's not quite what he said. In Texas, I'll tell you what, he, we translate it this way. What he literally said is, shut your mouth. That's what he says to the storm. Jesus Christ says to the raging storm, lay down, shut up, and get gagged. That's what it says in the Greek. The storm goes, <laughs> the water got his tranquil. Let's look at the boys. They were horrified of the storm. Now they're petrified of who's in their boat. <laughs> what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves? Well, anyway, they finally get across the sea, and the little gangplank comes down. We're introduced to our, our, our player tonight, the nude rude dude. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Gangplank comes down. Jesus steps off. Immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. That's a soft word for a bad meaning. A man with an unclean spirit. The Greek word written there is demonizomaya. It means on the total control of devils. Let's look and see how the devil does his children. This guy's living naked in a graveyard. He's night and day, he's slashing suicidal, slashing himself with stones, does not have one stitch of clothes on. Can you imagine what he must have looked like? You have open wounds living in a graveyard with dead, rotting bones. You are full of sores. Not one stitch of clothes on, hair matted down to his shoulders, foaming maniac of a man. That's who meets Jesus. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't get in the boat and go, whoo, let's go back, boys. <laughs> You'll find out when Jesus shows up, anybody is harvestable. This is, this is a maniac of a man, an absolute lunatic, living up there in the graveyard. It says in your Bible, no man could bind him. No, not with chains or fetters. Often he'd been bound with chains and fetters, and he'd pop them asunder. Night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs crying, slashing himself with stones. Wow, now he's at the presence of Jesus. Jesus says, what is your name? And he answers in the plural, my name is Legion, for there's a bunch of us. Wow. You ought to hear him just hissing, my name is Legion, for we're many. And Jesus begins to dialogue with the demons in him. The demons are saying, don't send us out of the country. It's a bunch of pigs up on the hillside. About 2,000 of them. And the demons are saying to Jesus, send us there. Let, let us go there. And Jesus gave them leave. Told them they could get out of the man, go get in the pigs. This is what your Bible says, Mark chapter 5. It says, immediately the pigs, the demons left, got in the pigs. And it says the pigs went nuts, ran violently down a steep slope into the ocean and drowned themselves in the ocean. We got about 2,000 bobbling dead pigs. It is a case of mass swine aside if I've ever seen it. <laughs> Don't you think? They're dead. Now, the guys keeping the pigs, the guys keeping the pigs, they go, we better run into town and tell the pig owners business looks bad. So they ran into town. They tell the pig the owners, you better get out here. Something's coming down horrible. So it says the guys that owned the pigs came out to see what was going on. And here's what your Bible says. When they came, they see him who had had the legion of demons. Now he's seated clothed in his right mind. If ever there was a time for them to throw their hands up and go, glory to God, hallelujah. What we've longed for has happened. That's not what these guys did. These guys in the most hostile tone said to Jesus, hey, it costs too much to have you in town. Get your bags, get your stuff, and get out of our neighborhood. That's what they said. Jesus is getting his stuff together. He only comes where he's invited. He's only comes where he's wanted. He's getting his stuff, and the guy who is seated, clothed in his right mind now says, Oh, Jesus, let me go with you. Jesus said, No, that's not the plan. The plan is for you to go back to your friend, family, your friends, show them and tell them and reveal to them what great things the Lord has done for you. And the Bible says, the Bible says, he went back to his family, his friends, and he showed them, taught them, tell them about what God had done for them. And here's what it says. He went to Decapitus. Decapitus is a word for a 10-city region along the coastline. And here's what it says. And everyone that heard him marveled. Ask the theologians what that means. It means they got born again. Wait a minute. We're talking about hold on to hope. What a difference one day makes. 
This guy woke up a maniac in a graveyard, and he goes to bed a missionary. Wow! One day. Woke up a screaming naked maniac, and now we see him in one day, clothed, seated, now a missionary to Ten City Region. Wow. What a difference one day can make. That's a drastic change, don't you think? I do. Pretty marvelous. Is there any more of those in the Bible? Oh, they're full of them. Here's one of the greatest ones you'll ever see. Study the annals of history. You'll never find anything that compares with this kind of a restoration. Isn't it Joel 2.25? I will restore, declares the Lord. I like these bongos or whatever these are. I can't play anything. I can't play a radio. Woo! Uh -oh. <laughs> this won't take long. Uh, I, you know, I really, I can't. I, I love music, but, you know, I don't know how to play it. I like to listen to different kinds of music. Different kind of music does different things with moods. There's a company called Muzak. Muzak. They understand that, don't they? If you ever studied about Muzak, they play different songs, sounds to get you to do different things. You walk into a, some of the malls, you, hear, you don't even hear it, but in the background there's music. And it's not, dum, 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 dum. it's something light and airy, like, good, look, I'd like one of those. I think I'll take some of those. And, yeah. <laughs> Music sheds moods. Really does. All oh, my exes, Lee in a hall, man. <laughs> Have you listened to some of the lyrics of the country and western songs? One of them so helped me. It says, she thinks my tractor is sexy. <laughs> now, I can't get that. I don't know where they got that. That's, that's one of the lyrics in a country western song. But anyway, uh, let's, music makes a difference now. That's, and I'm not going to sing anymore because, uh, listen, here we go. We're going to talk about the greatest restoration that I can find in the Bible. It's, uh, you have to go all the way to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Have you ever made a, a vow or a promise to somebody and then you got busy and just forgot all about it? Wow. That happened to my little grandson. He's 21 now, but when he was a little boy, when he was a little bitty boy like that, he talked with a lisp. His name is Brandon, a little bitty boy like that. So he called me the Peppo Preet. I want you to do something for me. I said, Brandon, I'll do whatever I can. He said, I want you to buy me a living hamster. I want you to buy me a living hamster. I said, okay, I'll, I'll get you a hamster. And, you know, I just absolutely forgot about getting him a living hamster. So uh, somewhere around January, the middle of January one time, I get a call. It's Brandon. He said, Peppo Preet, you lied to me. I said, no, Brandon, I didn't lie to you. He said, you told me you'd get me a living hamster. My birthday came, no hamster. Christmas came, no hamster. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I said to Brandon, Brandon, I am so sorry. I will get you a living hamster. That was his, he wants a living hamster. So I called Brandon's mother. I said, Cheryl. You go get that boy a hamster. I don't care what it is. After a while, I get a call. She said, Papa, I'm here at the pet store. They got a hamster for 17 something dollars, but the cage is $72. I said, get that boy a hamster and get the cage. So I finally got him a living hamster. Now I go down one day, and my son, my son, his dad, my son hated the hamster. He said, Dad, I hate that hamster. Said he sleeps all day and runs all night. <laughs> Yeah, said it's the craziest thing. But anyway, so here we are. There's the, there's the living hamster, and he's in his $72 cage. So I, I said, uh, Brandon, where's hamster? And there's a big ball of fur. He made a bed, and the hamster was curled up in the fur asleep. He said, he's sleeping. I said, well, wake him up. He said, he, he's sleeping. He'll bite you. I, I'm going to see me a $100 hamster. So he, he said, again, he'll bite you. I ran my finger, this one, I ran my finger in the hamster cage, out of the ball of fur, bit the hamster, bit the, you can see the two holes right here is my fingers. <laughs> see them two holes right there? Yeah. That's hamster teeth. <laughs> bit all the way through my finger. I swung the cage hamster and everything. Blood just pumping. My little grandson, I told you about you. <laughs> Good gracious. Let me tell you about Brandon's mouth. Brandon, uh, oh, they want to do const uh, Oh, reconstruction in his uh, mouth to make his uh, verbiage and his talking right. And we're riding down the road. And he's a little bitty boy in the truck with me strapped in the street. And he looked at me and said, Peppo Preet, 
I want to ask you something. I said, okay. I said, what do you want to ask me? He said, why did Jesus make my teeth like this? Wow. That's a big question for a little kid, isn't it? Boy, you make fun of him once, he'd tell you, don't do that. If you did it again, he'd knock your lights out. <laughs> I mean, listen, he'd whack you, man. He didn't care if he's, he'd whack you. So anyway, why did Jesus make my teeth like that? I said, Brandon, I don't have an answer for that, but I'll tell you one thing I do know. He's going to fix it. And the doctors wanted to do, oh, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to do reconstruction surgery. But guess what happened? They carried him to some dentist, and this dentist came up with some kind of little piece that looked like fishing cord, put it around the backside, put it up here, reconstructed this whole thing. He talks perfect, absolutely perfect for nearly nothing. See, God fixed it. He can, he can talk a storm now. He's, he's 21 now. Good gracious. A pipeline welder. 19 years old, he comes in with a brand new Ford Dooley truck, one of these King Ranch Dooley trucks. 19 and a trailer long as this room, it looked like. I said, Brandon, and a brand new Miller welder or some kind of welding machine on the back. I said, Brandon, what banker loaned you this money? I need to talk to him. You know what I mean. <laughs> Isn't it? But that's something. So he's a pipeline welder now. But uh, I'm telling you, he's something else. Good gracious. But anyway... Uh, tough as a boot, that kid is. He, yeah, he travels around with me some. He, he, he'll get in your business if you mess with him. Yeah. You come with the cocky attitude, he'll read your mail too. He'll, he'll tell you the stuff going on wrong with you. He'll tell you how to get it right. He, he's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Brandon. Brandon means bright, shining warrior. That's the name. Yeah. Anyway, well, but I am said all the hamster story to tell you. Have, I made a promise to Brandon, but I got so busy I forgot about it. That's 2 Samuel 9, 1. David had made a promise to Jonathan. It says, show me favor, me and my family, all of my life, and all of my descendants' life. David said, yes, I will. They cut a covenant. Now we find the Bible says in 2 Samuel 8, David has fought his battles. There's a time of respite. There's a time that he's just kind of catching his breath. He's back at the palace. And have you ever found that sometimes when you slow down a little bit, you think about what you happened? He goes, oh, my God. I made a covenant with Jonathan. I'd show him and his descendants favor all of their life. And he said, I've been negligent to do that. See, Saul, Saul and Jonathan, Saul was Jonathan's dad, and he was a king. Jonathan was headed to the throne, but he knew that David was supposed to be the real king. And I love Jonathan because he served God's chosen one instead of saying, that place ought to have been mine. And Jonathan's a great, great story of loyalty. And so anyway, so David goes, oh, Lord, I have not been, I've, I've let this slip through the cracks. And so 2 Samuel 9, David says, is there anybody left of the household of Saul that I could show them kindness and favor for Jonathan's sake. And there's a guy named Ziba that, that worked in the palace area there. And here's what he, Ziba says. Yes, yes, there is. Jonathan had a son, but he's lame in his legs. So you find all the way back there, it says in 2 Samuel 4, when Jonathan was a little five-year-old boy, word comes that his dad's been killed and his grandfather's been killed in battle. It says a nurse, a nanny, a woman picked up the little five-year-old prince and starts with him. I don't think she's malicious. I think she's trying to get him to safety, trying to get him to a different place. Somehow there's an accident. The little prince dropped her. He was falling on. It doesn't say how it happened. It just says he was lame in his legs. There's, and it, you look at the Hebrew word lame, it's the, most, it's the strongest word for paralyzed. He's, he's paralyzed from the neck down from the time he's five. Ah, oh, man. And so the David had forgot all about him, didn't even know anything about him. Now David's going, oh, man. And he says to Ziba, Ziba, I want you to find out. Is anybody left of the household of Saul? Yeah, Saul had a boy. His name was uh, Mephibosheth. He's lame in his legs. And uh, David said, find him and find out where he is. We find Mephibosheth living down in a city, uh, not a city, a region called Lodibar. Say Lodibar. I say this to you right now. Nobody in their right mind would live in Lodibar. Only people that did live in Lodibar were thugs and robbers. Mean, outlaw kind of people. Lodibar, the word Lodibar means dry, barren, and uninhabitable. Dry, barren, and uninhabitable. And that's, he's living down there with his uncle, Malkar. Oh, boy. You might say, thank God for Uncle Malkar. Ooh, that guy's a jerk. You look up his Hebrew word, Malkar, it means salesman, 
Sounds pretty noble till you find out he's the kind of salesman that sells his daughter down at the camel stop. He's a pimp. He's a thug. Malcar. It means salesman making money at anybody's cost. That's who's raising the little crippled prince down in a rag shack in Lodi Bar. Lodi Bar, dry, barren, uninhabitable. Only people live there is outlaws. Every day, I'm sure the little prince heard something like this from Uncle Malcar. Hey, boy, if it wasn't for me, that king back there, David, drag you up to the palace, slit your throat, hang you on the gate, let the buzzards eat your skin. See, that's what happened to when one king would kill every one of the descendants of the prior king. But David's not that away. He's a man after God's own heart. Now he's sending out Ziba. David says to Ziba, Ziba, you go and find Mephibosheth. So there they go, Ziba and an entourage from King David, off to this bad land called Lodibar, looking for Mephibosheth. The word Mephibosheth means dispeller and dispenser of shame. That's what the name means. Sure enough, let's put ourselves down there in Lodi Bar. It's hot, desert, barren, uninhabitable, dust blowing. Somebody looks and they go, what's that dust cloud away over there? Why, wait a minute, wait. That flag, that's David's flag. Who in the world would be coming here? Sure enough, an entourage pulls up to a rag shack. Somebody in kingly authority says, may a chef live here? Somebody at the trembling voice says, yes, bring him out. How would you like to be Mephibosheth, this little lied to crippled prince? You say, Bobby, what does a crippled prince have to do with me? Oh, you can't imagine the Christians I've run into just as desperate as crippled prince. Somebody dropped them. Somebody mishandled them. Oh, they, they got a cadence, but their heart, they can't move in their heart. They're lame in their spiritual walk. So here, we're going to see God rectify that. Mephibosheth, yes, bring him out. They bring Mephibosheth out. He crawls like a, like a lizard. And they put him in a chariot. And they bring him back to Jerusalem, to David's palace. Wow. I'll show you something you'll never find in any other protocol. No king ever would do what David did. No king ever. There's all kind of protocols and things you have to do to approach a king's throne. You can't just press in. That's Esther. You, there's a protocol to come greet a seated king. But David breaks every protocol when Mephibosheth comes up. He gets up off of the throne and goes out to meet him. Out to meet him. And he says, Mephibosheth. Listen to Mephibosheth. Here's what Mephibosheth says about himself. Who? Who am I? Such a dead dog that you would address me. That's what he says. Who, who am I? Such a dead dog that you would ad address me. Wow. On the, in the dust on his face before. In the Jewish culture, you'll never find a, a, a lower degree of self-worth than for him to say to himself, I'm a dead dog. That's the lowest Jewish thing you could think of. Who am I such a dead dog that you would address me? And here's what David says. Bring him into my palace. And then here's the greatest story of restoration you'll ever find. Well, I want to read it because it's almost unbelievable. Uh, I'm, I'm over here in 2 Samuel 9. Okay, 2 Samuel 9. And watch this. Now, David said to him, fear not, for I will surely show you kindness. This is verse 7. 2 Samuel 9, verse 7. David said to him, fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan's your father's sake and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfathers, and you shall eat bread at my table. Wow. His grandfather was a king. His father was the son of a king. And now King David says, boy, I'm going to give you back everything that was your grandfather's. Biggest, biggest wealth transfer you can find happens right here. Watch this. Verse 8, and the cripple bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Verse 9, then the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, and, said, and sent for him and said, I have given your master's son, your, his grandson, all that belonged to Saul and to his house. Verse 10, and you 
shall tend the land for him. You and your sons and your servants. And you shall bring in the produce that your master's heir may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat always at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. You talk about Ziba getting his bubble, his bubble burst. See, he was overseer of all the King Saul's stuff. And David said, this is the day all of this changes. You, your 15 sons and your 20 servants are going to serve Mephibosheth the rest of your life. You're going to give him back all the land, all the properties that was his grandfather's, King Saul, all the things that was his, his uh, father's, uh, Jonathan's, and you're going to restore the wealth to him. Wow. And he's going to eat bread at my table all the days of his life. Now, wait a minute. Wait. The whole message is holding on to hope. What a difference one day can make. He woke up in a rag shack in Lodibar. He goes to bed that night in the palace. What a difference one day can make. See, hold on to hope. Don't ever give up on your dreams. God will see to it. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? You talk about a wealth transfer, that's one, isn't it? You can imagine all the land. That's pretty wild. I, I like that. Wow. I like that. The Bible said if God be for us, who can be against us? God has a way of balancing out everything. Now, you say, well, Bobby, why has that not happened in my life? Well, I'll tell you what. When you begin to thank God for it before it happens, that's when it'll accelerate. Just begin to thank him. Thank him. Have you ever misinterpreted a verse? Well, sure. There's a verse in the book of Romans that says, If you have an enemy, pray for him. It'll be like heaping coals of fire on his head. Now, in Texas, I thought, well, God won't let me whip him. But God will whip him for me. See, that's, you know. If you've got an enemy, pray for him. It'll be like heaping coals of fire on his head. Thinking, well, God won't let me get him, but God will get him for me. Totally not what that means at all. Back in those days, they transferred fire with living coals. And they transferred the living coals on a crock pot, a clay pot on their heads. Now, if you've got an enemy... And you start praying for him. It's like heaping coals of fire upon his head. It means he can't stay in that position very long. You see what I'm talking about? He can't stay an adversary very long if you're really praying for him. And you see what I'm talking about? Now, here's your great verse, if you want it, about your adversaries. Psalms 112. You ought to study the whole uh, verses there. What I, they told me, said, now, if you're going to squeal, get in front of the speakers. Yeah. He said, be sure that you get in front of the speakers if you want to squeal. So I better stay over here in the center. See how teachable I am? <laughs> yes. That's the sound it made when they were sewing my tongue. <laughs> Cut my tongue off playing football. And it sure did. And I did like that. And I done this. I tackled a guy just in time for his heel to catch my chin. Just like that, my tongue off. I went to the I can't say what the coach says like, gee, we got to get you to the hospital. <laughs> they carried me to sew my tongue back on. Yeah, yeah. Did I tell you all the story? No. Uh, yeah, you may hear it. <laughs> so they carried me. I went to, went to the bench just instantly when I bit my tongue off. My whole mouth was filled like it's full of jello. I went to the bench. I did. The coach goes to cussing like you can't imagine. And, we got to get you to the hospital. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> Friday night football in Texas. So I, they carried me down to Dr. Rom. You didn't know him, but he, Dr. Rom. So here's what Dr. Rom said. Well, I got good news, not got bad news. The good news is I can sew it back on. The bad news is I can't deaden it. If they deaden it, you'll, you could swallow it and, you, you, and uh, asphyxiate. So I go, oh, yeah. That means okay. <laughs> And he starts sewing my tongue together. Have you ever seen the needle? It's crooked. It's crooked like it goes up through, back through. Then in the middle of the, you hear, I'll translate that for you. I'll knock you out when I get out of this chair. That's what I sewed my tongue back on. Oh, man, boy, it feels that time. Feel pretty good now. 
I thought that we get out of the chair and the doctor said, the doctor said, I got real bad news now. The real bad news is this. It's going to hurt a lot worse when I take them out. I said, him. I said, run in right now. You got to take them out. You'll need the interpretation for that too. I'll leave a couple of words out. I'll tell you one thing, big boy. You ain't taking them out. That's what I said to him. I took him out myself. Self-medicated. <laughs> Bit the knots off and pulled him out myself. But it's working. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. That's, that's the truth. I don't know where in the world I was on the message now, but anyway. <laughs> Do what? Psalms 112. Psalms 112. All right. This is about your adversaries. Yeah. Yeah, here it is, Psalms 112. Thank you for keeping notes. Here it is. I'd have come around to it after a while. It's like a hound dog chasing a rabbit. He'll come back by. He'll run him by your truck after a while. But anyway, here it is. Psalms 112 verse 2 says, The favor the blessings of God will get on your life in such a magnitude, it'll make your enemies so mad they'll gnash their teeth and walk away. Amen. The favor the goodness of God will get on you in such a dimension, your prosperity will be so big, it'll make your enemies so mad they'll gnash their teeth and walk away. That's a lot better than a lawsuit, don't you think? Psalms 112. Here's your great verse about favor, Psalms 84. Psalms 84, verse 11 says, God will be a sun and a shield. No good thing will he withhold from those that are walking upright. He will be He'll be that sun and a shield. And here's what he says. I will give you present day favor, future glory, honor, splendor, and heavenly bliss. Psalms 84, 11. Wow. I like that. Present day favor, future glory, honor, splendor, and heavenly bliss. Wow. It seems like the longer you walk with God, the better, the better things get. Yeah. Is there any way to accelerate that? 2 Corinthians 3.18 accelerates that. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, As we behold him with an unveiled face, we're changed from glory unto glory. One translation says, Into ever increasing dimensions of glory. Wow. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, as we behold him with unveiled faces. See, my hand could be a veil, couldn't it? I can see you, but not distinctly because there's a veil in the way. As we behold him with an unveiled face. So I decided I'm going to study and find out what veil is over the face of the church, keeping us from seeing Jesus like he really is. It's going to stun you. The veil over the church, keeping us from seeing Jesus in his resurrected splendor, is tradition. It's the only thing I've ever found the Bible more powerful than the Bible. Teaching for commandments, the traditions of men, and making the word of God of none effect. Wow, tradition. It starts out like this. Well, I know the Bible says that, but, whoa. Now, if the Bible says it, that settles it. No argument, no, that's the way it is. People hate absolutes, but the Bible is absolute. It's the absolute, absolute on the earth. I'm serious. Boy, I'll tell you what, a progressive generation don't want to hear that, do they? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to see God move in the millennials like you've never seen in your life. I guarantee you this, a mighty move of God is coming to the millennials. I guarantee you. You go, how's it going to come? God's going to set them free with the holy reverential fear of the Lord. They're going to get two arrows shot. And the heirs are going to have John 17, 17, and it'll unlock the holy reverential fear of the Lord for the millennials. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. You watch this. God's going to set these millennials free with the holy reverential fear of the Lord, and they're going to come rapid into the kingdom of God. The word sanctify, John 17, 17, Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctified means cleaned up, set apart for the service of God. So that's going to happen. Well, we've got to get out of here. It's kind of late. We've got another service in the morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow. It's only a day away. Talking about singing, I, I, I do things just spontaneous in the services. So I'm up there, I'm up there in uh, uh, California or down there in California. And I, I'm there and uh, we're in a, a, a Korean church in Anaheim, California, packed to the hilt. And you remember uh, years, a few years ago, this song about uh, the X Factor? It was, pants on the ground, pants on the ground, walk around like a fool with pants on the ground. Y'all remember that song? Y'all don't remember that? Well, it was a big deal. 
There's a guy, it went all over uh, uh, America. Pants on the ground, pants on the ground. Walk around like fools, pants on the ground. And anyway, so I'm up there in this Korean church in Anaheim, California. And it is packed to the hilt with people. And I, I'm just kind of, and I said to a girl sitting out there, never seen her before in my life. I said, hey, stand up. She stood up and I said to her, I want you to sing pants on the ground, pants on the ground, walk around like fool with pants on the ground, but I want you to sing it in high opera. I like to fell off the platform. She starts in high, she was an opera singer, a famous opera singer, and sang pants on the ground in high opera. And there, I, yeah, see, I'd never seen her for my whole life. Let me give you another one of those just picking the people out of the crowd. I'm over there in Vienna, Austria with Rick Joyner. And there's, I don't know, two or 3,000 people in this room. So I'm supposed to be the preacher. So there's, there's Rick sitting there. So all these people are there, Vienna, Austria. So I get up to preach. And instead of preaching, I look out across the service. And I've said to a woman, hey, I want you to give me a haircut. Vienna, Austria, first time I ever, was ever there in that place. And I say to this woman, hey, I want you to give me a haircut. And she said in perfect English, yes, I have my equipment with me. <laughs> Rick Joyner said, you know what, woman? I said, I've never seen that woman in my whole life. <laughs> Rick Joyner had to hold the men's room, the door open for the men's room in the Coliseum so that woman could wash my hair. You couldn't be in the bathroom with a strange woman, you know. So he's got the door open while the woman washed my hair and gave me a haircut. He said, what if she couldn't have cut hair? I said, oh, a couple of weeks, it had been over. <laughs> But what she was, she was a hairdresser for that uh, harmonic orchestra that's over there, whatever that is, Vienna Orchestra, whatever. She was a hairdresser. I went back next year, she gave me another haircut. <laughs> now, here's another, and I'm down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I got pictures for this one. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm walking around preaching, and I, uh, there's a little old lady out in the middle of the crowd, and I said to her, Ma'am, stand up. She stood up, and I said, I want you to bake me a pie. <laughs> and she says, Certainly, and sit down. Preacher said to me, you know who that is? No, I don't know who that is. She's a famous pie baker. Been on the magazines, what, Home and Garden. And she's a, a, a famous pie baker. She, oh, I got, me on, I got him on the phone. Meringue tall as a truck window, you know. <laughs> but see, you have not because you ask not. We got to get more, we got to get more spontaneous, don't you think? Well, you know, what if she couldn't have cooked? Here, here's, you want one more of those stories? My wife and I are down in the Coliseum in Houston doing one of our meetings. So I never stay up here hardly when I'm preaching. I walk around. So I'm walking off the platform in a Coliseum there in Houston. I walk by a man in a suit and his son right there. Never seen him before. And I had the strongest compulsion to slap him. I want to slap this guy so bad. I go, good, Lord. <laughs> And I'm walking away like that, and I thought, what in the world is that? So I walked back over there, and I said, it's all I could do. I had to keep my hand in my pocket. I thought, oh, Lord. My wife is sitting there, and she's got this troubled look on her face. I got a troubled look on my face. So I walk away twice, and I go back the third time. This time, I said, sir, I am so sorry. I, I have the strongest compulsion to slap you. When I said slap you, him and his son fell out in the floor, and he's in a suit, and she, he's screaming, it's real, it's real, thank God, the prophetic's real. I said, get him up. <laughs> I said, how in the world do you know the prophetic's real? He said, me and my son didn't believe in the prophetic. He said, we didn't believe what you did was real. We didn't think it was from God. So we made a covenant out in the parking lot. We said, we're going to make a secret sign. If he says anything about slapping us, we'll know it's really from God. <laughs> <laughs> So I said to him, I won't slap you. I'll just let God do it. I did like that, and it knocked him about four rows over. Yeah. See, now, that's something, don't you think? I like that kind of stuff. But see, you know, I didn't want to slap the guy, but I would have if I had to. I told you about nibbling the guy's ear, didn't I? It can't get much worse than that. Yeah. They said, oh, be careful. The richest, most influential man in Europe is here, and he's hostile to the prophetic. I said, don't worry. Bring him right down here. Yeah, that's the one that had the nibble on his ear. Yeah, I told you a while ago, nothing helps like swift and complete obedience. That's true. You go, I don't believe God asked you to do something like, yeah, he will. Yeah, he'll ask you to do some strange things to see for you to see your heart. Wow. Anyway. A lot of others. 
Any more stories about what a difference one day makes? Yeah, I won't, I won't go into this in very far. Is Second Kings chapter 6. The worst famine mentioned in human history. You've never seen anything like the famine in Second Kings chapter 6. You meet a king walking on a wall. You hear a woman screaming, help me, king, help me. You hear the king say, ma'am, there's no food in the bin. There's no oil in the vat. If God doesn't help you, I can't help you. The famine is so severe, 2 Kings chapter 6. Famine is so, so severe. This is a part I detest it being in the Bible. It was so bad they were boiling their children and cannibalizing their own children. And this woman is screaming at the king, king, help me, king, help me. And he said, ma'am, I can't help you. There's nothing. There's, if God doesn't help you, there's no way you can get help. And then he says to her, why is it you're such so agitated? And then she says it, because of this woman. Yesterday she said, if we'll eat your son, then tomorrow we'll eat my son. And then it says in your Bible, so we boiled my son and ate him. Oh, Lord. My mind won't even go there. So we boiled my son and ate him. And now today she's hidden her son from me. Not being remorseful that she just cannibalized her own son. But being remorseful because this woman has hidden supper from her. Wow, it said the king ripped his robe. Had sackcloth under there. Great humility. And then you have to fast forward to 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 1. Starts with the English word T-H-E-N. Then, that throws it right back into chapter 6. Then, the prophet stands and says, about this time tomorrow, there'll be more food in this village than you could imagine. Wow. Right in the middle of famine. Anybody can prosper when the bread, prophesy when the bread truck's back in. This right in the middle of famine, about this time tomorrow. Now, you never get a good word without somebody trying to talk you away from it. Second Kings says there was a wise guy that listened to, the king listened to, and here's what he said when he heard the prophetic word. No way, that'll never happen. Even if God ripped open heaven, God wouldn't do that. And so the prophet, I'll paraphrase, said, okay, big mouth, you'll see it, but you won't get to participate. If you read the rest of the story, that's exactly what happened, isn't it? This strange, strange story. There were, we're already in Second Kings chapter 7. The prophets prophesied about this time tomorrow. And then the story just shifts. cha -chum! There's four lepers laying outside the gate. Guys, I don't want to hear about four sick dudes. I want to know who's bringing the groceries. Where'd these four sick dudes come into it at? There are four lepers laying outside the gate. How'd they get in the story? What have they got to do with feeding a starving village? They're so advanced leprosy, they're outside the gate. And I love their attitude. They got to take an inventory. They said, if we lay here, we're going to die. If we go back in there, Samaria, the city of Samaria, we're going to starve. Our only course of action is to get up and go face this army out here that's caused the famine. Wow. Four limping lepers. I've nicknamed one of them Limping Larry. <laughs> Leprosy pieces fall off. Can't you see him laying in a puss pool? Yeah, you're half the man you used to be. Yeah, you're all thumbs. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like that. But here's, they, they finally make up choice. And they said, if we lay here, we're going to die. Let's get up and challenge change. And here's what your Bible says. These four limping lepers start out toward this army, a hostile army. And it says when they get the enemy camp, the camp is still intact. All the food is there. It says there's gold and silver in abundance, everything. But the enemy is gone. Now, what in the world happened? How can four limping, sick, putrefying guys chase off a whole army? It says this. Before the lepers got there, God sent a sound. Say sound. And it was the sound of armies marching, chariots, wheels rolling, shields, spears, swords. That's what the enemy heard. Who's coming? Limping Larry. <laughs> but see, the battle's not ours, it's God's. And these lepers get there, and boy, the, the place is packed out, all kind of fancy clothes, gold, silver in abundance, and they're picking it up, hiding it. And then they wake up, they go, Wait a minute. This can't be just for us. What about our brothers back there? Let's stop just a moment, New Life. How does that relate to us? What about our brothers back there in those traditional churches? Don't even know there's a banquet table. Don't even know there's the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Don't even know the gifts of the Spirit flow. We're hiding it in the sand. 
And they said, if we keep this up, something bad will happen. Let's go back and get them involved also. Hey, open up, they said. Remember that wise guy? No, it's a trick. But finally, the king finds out it's real. They bring the food to the gate, open the gate. There's such a zeal to get the food. What happens? Somebody gets killed. Who was it? He got trampled to death as the people ran to get the food. Well, that's something. I like the kid with the hat on in the middle there. That's you. Yeah. I'll tell you what's happening. God's got big plans for you. You've been running from them, but you're going to start running to them. Look out now. God's going to run over you with his goodness. You're going to get the verse out of Deuteronomy, stay on track with God, and the blessings of God will overtake you. That's it. See, God talked to you when you were younger, but then you kind of turned away from that. But somebody made fun of you. But listen, God's got big plans for you, okay? So the, my advice to you is swim to the boat. He's already hooked you. Just swim to the boat. Okay? I'm just, it'll, it'll save you a lot of, God will God'll get you to hammerlock if he has to. Ask Jonah. Remember that? Yeah. Jonah wanted an itinerary change without consulting God. Took off the wrong way. But God's got big plan, plans for you, so run to him, okay? Yeah, that's good. He goes, why you picked me out? Because I'm talking to you. <laughs> Somebody you say, you got anything for me? I've been talking to you all night. <laughs> Don't you think? Well, anyway, but listen, run to him, okay? His plans are better than you can make for yourself. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. I know my thoughts, I think, towards you, declares the Lord. Thoughts of your success, not your failure. Buffed up, are you? I could knock a horse out with one punch and pick up a Chevy 2 car, but I couldn't whip a bear. <laughs> I, I fought a bear, and the bear whipped me bad in front of the whole town. Thank God the only town, town had only 202 people in it. Yeah, it had 202 people. I'll be 74 this year. I went back to town. It's up to 598. <laughs> That thing's in a growth spurt, the little town where I grew up. But I could knock a horse out with one punch. I got, well, they put me in the pen for that now, but, but they paid me for it then. <laughs> put on a Saturday show down at the station. Yeah. Wing, there he goes, this kid. Come on here. Let's make a great escape. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Said, I'm leaving while I can. Yeah. Don't you love kids? Yeah. Oh, man. I love kids and old people. They'll tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, others are kind of political. Well, anyway, here's what I want to say to you. Hold on to the dreams God has given you because God will pull them off. Hold on to hope. Don't give up on a single dream God has promised you. His promises are what? Yes, yes. Say yes. yes. Here's what the Bible said. He'll roar over his people with the word yes. If God gave you a dream and a hope, a vision, he'll pull it off. Sometimes he'll wait even till it looks like, oh, there's really no way now. You think I'm wrong? Ask Abraham and Sarah. You're going to have a baby. No way! Then when it was, no way! They had one. Yeah. Isn't that good? So y'all had a little niff, did you? <laughs> I do a lot of marriage counseling. <laughs> Here it is. Here's my marriage counseling. All you got to say is, I do, and yes, dear. <laughs> you miss those two, nothing will work. Dr. Phil couldn't even help you. <laughs> I do, and... Yes, dear. Now, you have to make it sound like it's her idea. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. <laughs> oh, me and my wife, listen, good Lord. I quote how long we've been married, 53 years. And she quotes Genesis 18, uh, Genesis uh, 18. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That's what she'll quote. Oh, man, bless her heart. Women are different. When we first got married, we had a little old bathroom, had one of these medicine cabinets about this big. And every time I'd open it, her perfume would fall out. Now, I didn't mean it. I wasn't trying to be uh, cruel. She was gone. So I thought, I'm going to consolidate. I took all of her little perfume bottles and poured it into one aqua velva bottle. I did. She came in and squ she, she squealed and cried. Oh, Lord. I, did, I didn't know. You know, perfume in little bottles like that, little things like that. So I just poured them all in one big bottle. 
And then she had, she just, it just undone her because she had saved her money and bought the perfume for herself but when, before she got married so she'd have good fragrances. All right. So I said to her, honey, don't worry. I'll go get you some more. So I got the little bottle of Estee Lauder or whatever it was. And I go down there to a little nickel and dime store. And I said to the lady, ma'am, I need to buy a bottle of this. She looked at me like, you idiot. You can't buy this here. You have to go to a specialty store. And I said, well, do you have any other cologne? That's what I called it. She said, yeah, here's some. There was a bottle over there about this big for $3. They wanted 30 something dollars for a, that little bitty bottle of Marpage or something. Long vault. Thirty-something dollars make a house payment then on a trailer, you know. <laughs> anyway, I bought her a three-dollar bottle of Blue Walls. <laughs> Whoa! You put Blue Walls on you, they could smell you all the way over there to the factory. <laughs> Good Lord! When I brought in the Blue Walls, she cried worse than when I poured. <laughs> oh Lord! Aren't women something? Now, I, I have to watch it because the grandkids showed her how to do live streaming or whatever. She'll get me. But anyway, she, she, got, she got sick one time. She's back there in the bedroom. She's back there and she's cuddled up and she's in the bed. I'm in there in the recliner watching football. And I hear her down the hall, Bobby, Bobby. I, I said, oh, okay. So I get up and I'll go down the hallway and I crack the door. There she's covered up in the bed. Bobby. I said, yes, honey. Will you do something for me? Yes. So I come in. I think, she, I think well, she's going to ask me to bring her a, a drink of water or a 7-Up or something like that. Will you do something for me? I'm, yes. What is it you want? Now, this is a part you'll never figure out. Laying in the bed with the flu. Daddy. Yes, I will. I'll do what you want. Here it is. Would you clean off the top of the refrigerator? <laughs> what? I didn't even know we had one. <laughs> top of the refrigerator. I thought, where in the world? You know, I did. I got in there and got me a little. I found my golf tees, one of my flashlights, and up there on top of the refrigerator. Good. But women are like that, aren't they? Where, yeah. Would you clean off the top of the refrigerator? Bless her heart. People ask, what's it like being married to Bobby? Ooh, I got my version. She's got hers. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, listen, thank God for you. I'll tell you one thing you can't, you can't fool her. You can't put something over on her. Come with me one time, then we're through. I'm driving down Interstate 20. Back then you could do about 75, and I'm doing about 80. I'm running down Interstate 20, and through my peripheral vision, I see a sign that says, all the catfish you can eat, 1995. <laughs> That's me sliding the brakes. <laughs> I find me a turnaround, turn around, and I go back to the all you neat catfish. I'm coming in from a meeting. <sighs> I said, have you had fried catfish? It's good. So I'm there with fried catfish. They'll feed you all you want. You eat one plate, they'll bring another plate, and it's steaming hot. And I'm eating fried catfish. And so I am puffed full of fried catfish. I get in the car. We're driving back. I'm driving back home. And I get home. And I open the door. There's the whole dinner table set. Candles, plates, glasses. I go, oh, Lord. See, she's fixed to come home meal. And here I've been off at this all-unique fish place. I'm so full I can't hardly breathe. Then I thought, I'm going to act like I'm hungry. <laughs> so she brings in, she'd cooked pot roast with vegetables and all of this stuff. She puts it in my plate. Oh, I'm picking at it, and it's wonderful food. She goes, she grabbed my fingers up and smelt my fingers and said, You've been eating fish. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I ate leftover of pot roast for the whole week, you know. <laughs> but she smelt my fingers and knew I'd been eating fish. Yeah, so it's just, you're just better off to say, I'm guilty, I stopped and ate fish. Oh, man, goodness gracious. Tough as a boot that woman is. 
I'll tell you what, honest to God, she's the best Christian I've ever met anywhere. I've been around royalty, and I've been around street bums and dope addicts. She's absolutely the same. Has no pretense at all. I'm telling you, listen, it's amazing. Here's what she told me when we got in the supernatural. She said, Bobby, I'll follow you anywhere God leads you. I'll do anything God asks you to do. You ever get weird and start faking this, I'll be the first person to expose you. Wow. Now, that's good. That's accountability, isn't it? That sure is. Wow. She's tough as a boot, man. Yeah, my grandkids think she can do anything. Oh, Lord, she can just about it. Have it anyway. She's something else. She's been uh, really, really uh, excited over Donald Trump. What happened was uh, she had a very strong vision before the election. In the vision, Donald Trump came to our house and sewed this button on for her on her blouse. She said, Bobby stood this close to me, never said a word, said he sewed this button. Said, she told me, said, Bobby, that button would have been on here until Jesus comes. Said he meticulously with big hands sewed the button, sewed it tight, sewed it, left, came back, and checked it again. So I told my wife, he has just buttoned down the election, and since he came back another time, he's going to get two terms. So if you're listening, see, now that's really something. wonder why he came to my wife, because at that time there was this great hostility concerning his treatment of women. But he, 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 my wife said he's the most gentle thing, sewed the button on. So he buttoned down the election. And then came back and looked at the button again. Wow. Isn't that something? I said, if you want to see something about Donald Trump, look at his children. The, if ever they could have been some small brats, those kids could. But look at them. They honor their father. And it's not just because he's got the checkbook. There's a genuine honor there. Isn't that something? Wow. Anyway, let's, let's pray and we'll get out here. And we're coming back in the morning. So we talked about what we talked about. Hold on to hope, what a difference one day makes. But in the morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about what to do when you don't know what to do, and then what to do when you don't want to do nothing. You ever been where you don't want to do nothing? You want people to leave your lawn? You don't want to go to church. I What to do when you don't know what to do, and what to do when you don't feel like doing nothing. We'll look at that in the morning in the Bible, okay? Well, let me pray for you now. I want you to say, Lord, I ask you.